I love excitement when it comes to God's house. You know, we don't want to come in and just hold these pews down. You know, we want to come in excited to worship and praise our Lord and Savior. And uh, this is what it's all about, folks. And we thank you for being here. Um, just bear with us today. Our uh, pastor is out. He's not feeling too good this morning. But, uh, fortunately, things have already been worked out. God knew it. And Brother Jim is going to bring us the message this morning. Um, but some of it is going to be a little helpless skeleton as we go through it. But we're going to get through it. Because God's leading and we're just going to follow it. Um, so with that, I'll give you our Sunday school report. We have 40 members present this morning with four guests. Uh, for a total of 44. And we did fall short a year ago. And uh, like I ask you all the time, continue to please pray for our Sunday school program. Because we're about half of where we were pre-COVID. And we know the challenges. And uh we know a lot of folks were out sick that wouldn't have been here this morning. But please continue to pray for our Sunday school program. And uh, we fell short of our contacts. That says a lot to you. So we don't reach out to folks and let them know that you're missing them. Sometimes they just have to come back. So continue to reach out to those that we haven't seen in a while. And um, invite them back. We miss them. Upcoming announcements real quick. We'll cover those. Uh, March the 5th, we have our church council meeting for all you uh, committee leaders and church leaders. Please remember that. Uh, 6 p.m. on March the 5th. Then, if there's a error on the calendar, someone's not good. Say, I wasn't going to call you out. I was just going to see it. I was going to call you out. You just laughed yourself out. But anyway, on the bulletin, because usually after we have our church council meetings that following Wednesday, we will have our business meeting. So the bulletin it says the 12th, which is a Sunday at 8 o'clock. But um, so that Wednesday, March 8th, we'll have our business meeting, and that way the committees can bring forward what they discussed at church council. So please be in prayer for the, uh, those events. And just as a reminder, and I know it's a, over a month away, but it'll be here before you know it. April the 9th, our Easter service. We'll have our 7 a.m. Uh, sunrise service. And then what we'll do is we will not have Sunday school that Sunday. Uh, but folks, please be back at 10 for our regular worship service. Um, preacher's trying to work on some food, so maybe get your belly filled as well as your spirit that morning. So come on. Coffee. That'll work too. <laughs> All right. We talked about this this morning. <laughs> And I know we put these things in our bulletin so we can be prepared for them, so we can pray about them. But if you notice, April 26th through the, I'm sorry, 16th through the 18th, we're having a revival, a three night revival, starting at Sunday night at 6 and Monday and Tuesday at 7. Every day should be a revival. We should always be working to get closer to God and, and repenting of our sins and being prepared. Because revival, as we've seen across this great land the last couple of weeks, last couple of months, the Spirit is among us. The Spirit is working. God is working. And we don't want to be the ones getting his way. So if something happens in our day and we can keep rolling, that's what we'll do. Um, but uh, let's don't limit ourselves to what says on the schedule. Remember, we always work on God's time uh, and his will be done and we don't stay in the way. All right? Now, it is baptism. We did get pushed from last week, so that is where we're getting ready for now. After the challenge, we'll take care of that. Keith is on waiting. Um, I know I asked for some volunteers, so if one or two would like to meet me in the back, just because we got to put some things on the floor to keep folks from slipping as they come out. I think we only have two folks here out of the five or six we we're going to do. Um, but if you can come back and kind of help us out, Get things straightened up because I don't have any tripping hazards back here to folks start to get out of the baptism. Uh, so at this time. <coughs> Um, often, I am the youth minister here, 
Uh, but often my, my job title could just be gopher or do what Pastor Kimmy asked you to do. Uh, and a lot of times that can be stressful, but this isn't one of the cool times where, you know, I get called up to do a baptism and I think that's the coolest thing ever. So that's really exciting. we got two baptisms we're going to do. Just to remind everybody, uh, of course, we believe that baptism doesn't do anything spiritual to you. It is a, it is a, a public profession of faith. It is a symbol of what's already occur occurred. It is a symbol of how we die in Christ, we're buried with Him, and then we are, we'll be resurrected one day uh, with Him in the future, but also resurrected now into new life in Christ. So that's what we're going to see here real quick. All right, Adrian, come on in.
So it does. The song is called Lead Me to the Cross.
be able to uh, introduce Jim Reed and Angie and their family. Um, I've known Jim pretty much all of his adult life, and you know we have worshipped together, we served together. Uh, Jim has been a, a businessman most of his life, and I can relate to that for so high. And having said that, um, you know, we experience a lot of different things in life as we go along. And everybody's experiences aren't the same. So I don't know what Jim's going to be speaking about this morning, but I'm sure that uh, it'll be interesting. Uh, I respect Jim a lot, you know, because I've looked up to him and his success and his uh, representation of our community and our church at times. So having said that, I'm going to introduce Jim Reed as our guest speaker this morning, and I want y'all to make him welcome. And Jim, you got the pulpit, the liberty is yours, lived by God. Son of God. And this is the commendation that the light has come to the world, 
and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. You have a seat. This is a, um, on the surface, you know, not a lot here, but if you, if you dig a little deep, deeper, I think that there's a lot of, to be unpacked here, and we're going to try to do that. And again, I'll try to move quickly. I think so many times we have three responses when we read this, this scripture because it's hard to comprehend and it's hard to digest. I think a lot of times we just want to skip over it because we don't understand what Jesus is saying. A lot of times we move past it real fast because we do understand what he's saying, but it doesn't match up what we've been taught. Mm -hmm. um, in a, lot, in a lot of times in Sunday school and church in modern day times. And then the third response I think is a lot of people just pull out John 3.16 and convince themselves that as long as I said a prayer, uh, admitted that Jesus died on the cross, was the Son of God, that I'm good. And this goes to, contra this passage contradicts a lot of that. And the reason you, if you look at Nicodemus's life and you dig into who he was, you begin to understand why some of this doesn't, might not make sense. First thing we see is Nicodemus came by night. Um, he, he wasn't, we don't know that he was necessarily ashamed, but he was one of the Pharisees, which means he was a member of the Sanhedrin. And the Pharisees in the time were, were Jesus had ruffled all their feathers. Um, he had contradicted everything they had been taught over the last 3,000 years. They were anchored in the law. And, and Jesus came and upset the apple cart, eating those sinners and tax collectors and, and breaking all the rules that they had held sacred. So if we look at Nicodemus and being a Pharisee, look at who he was. By the, Nicodemus would have been picked to be a Pharisee by his parents before he was ever born. Um, he would have had to memorize the first four books, books of the Bible before he was 12 years old. As a teenager, he would have had to memorize the, the books, the prophets, and the Psalms. As an adult, he would have prayed three times every day at a set time. He would have fasted twice a week. He would have committed his life to, to following the 613 laws that are listed was given by God through Moses in the, in the book of Leviticus. Again, he was a member of the Saint, Saint Eder. In addition to those 1600, 600 laws, there was 1,500 laws that the Jewish uh, religious people of the time had expounded on that 613. So there's about 2,000 laws that he would have lived by every day. Um, his whole identity would have been wrapped up in following the law, praying three times a day. He would have had to count his steps on a Sunday to make sure he didn't walk too far because that would be considered work. It's, I read through some of this as I was researching for the messages. Some of the things they did were so crazy. If his house caught on fire, he wasn't allowed to carry his clothes out. That was considered work on Sunday or Saturday for them. But he could put on as many clothes as he could carry on his body and walk out. That wasn't a sin. I told you about counting the steps. As a child, his parents would have taken honey um, and brushed it on a scroll and made him lick the scroll as like a two-year-old kid because there's a verse in Psalms that said, your word would be sweeter than honey in my mouth. They did all these things that he would have started as, as early as he can remember to who he was. In doing that, he was highly esteemed in the community. His entire identity, self-worth, social standing, all of his friends, all of his family status would have been associated with his position as a Pharisee. His, he would have been, anybody that could do this, which was nearly impossible to do, would be very proud of the fact that all he had accomplished. Nicodemus, furthermore, when he comes, we see in the scripture, he acknowledges, hey, we, he says we, which means us and the other Pharisees, we recognize there's something different about you. You're not, you're not the same as all of us who did the law because Jesus is healing people, uh, healing the sick, preaching like nobody had ever preached before, and come out with this, you know, all the things about grace and all the things that Jesus taught. So he acknowledges that he is, that, that we recognize there is something different about you. Here's the summary part of just wrap all that portion of this up. Nicodemus was a better Christian than any of us sitting in this room on the best day of your life. By far, me included. He, he outdid all of us, yet he comes to Jesus, and what does Jesus say? That's not good enough. you got to be born again. 
So for all of us to sit here today and digest that, this is difficult. I joked with Alden, Alden is a the campus pastor where Angie and I go now, pretty good sized guy. So this is a hard message, I'm glad I brought my bodyguard. Um, <laughs> Alden's about 6'5", and I don't know how much he weighs, but it, he's bigger than me. Um, but the message that Jesus gives them is clear. And that is, is all the righteousness in the world does not get you to heaven. Jesus goes first and says, and we'll go to verse 8 real quick and just read it. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from or, or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. I think most of y'all know me, but you would hit a golf ball about two miles that way. Um, it would land in my yard. Um, live in a big field up there. Um, Jimmy's here, and so many times we you know, we, we farm over there, and uh, he does 99% of it. But I go out there and swap the hornet's nest, and uh, then I go back in the house and let him fix everything I messed up. But when it's in July, it's hot. There's no substitute for just the slightest cool breeze. Mm -hmm. If you drive past our house, you'll see the only trees there are the ones I planted up the driveway. There's not a tree in sight if you're sitting out in the field. But it's so refreshing, and I think that's what Jesus is saying here. The spirit, a spirit-filled Christian or someone that walks with God is like the wind. You can't see where they come. You can't see where they go. It's very, they're refreshing. But even though you can't see the wind, you know where it came from or where it went. It has an impact on everything around it. It affects all of it touches. And it affects it in a good way. I think that's what God's called it. That's what, what Jesus is trying to unpack for Nicodemus here is that all that righteousness doesn't do you any good if you're not affecting those around you. A few more things, and we're, we're moving, I'm going to move quickly because I want to give some time at the end. But in verse 13, you see that Jesus says, No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. Jesus is telling Nicodemus, I'm, I'm the Christ. I'm the Son of God. You come and say there's something different about me. There is. I'm, I'm, I'm Jesus. I'm the Christ that has been preached about, taught about, what you memorized about for all these years. The second thing in verse, verse 14, Jesus says, As Moses lifted up the serpent, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is back from the Exodus, when the, the children of Israel were being bit by snakes, by serpents. God commanded Moses to put a serpent on a pole, put up, and those who looked upon that serpent would be healed. Nicodemus would have known the story very, very well because he memorized it as a, as a youth. Jesus is foretelling Nicodemus of his crucifixion and what was fixing to happen in the next couple weeks. I don't know how, you know, how much insight Nicodemus had if he figured it out. The Bible doesn't tell us that. But, but Jesus thinks enough of it in, in, in this conversation and knows that Nicodemus came to with a pure heart to tell him, I'm the Christ and I'm going to die. And people are going to be saved by looking at the cross that I will have to go to in a few weeks. I understand the passage that we have contradicts so many things that we've been taught over the years in Sunday school and that we've all gone to. But I trust you to the degree it's too much to just gloss over real, real quickly. First of all, I want to state that there is, I am not preaching it at all, but there is a works way to heaven. There's not. On your best day, you're not good enough to work, or can't work hard enough to get to heaven. Number two, unfortunately, a single prayer you said years ago doesn't make you born again. John 3.16 doesn't say, for God so sent a prayer. A one-time acknowledgement that Jesus is God's son doesn't save you. Remember back in Mark 7 that Jesus pulled up in the boat on the boat and there was the demon, the demon-possessed man in the gatherings. And, and I'm not going to go there because we need to move through, but you can look it up later. When the demon came out, he, he, was, he, told, him, he, he told him who he was, but he said, what do, you, what do you have, sorry, what do you want with me, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? If the standard that we set was just acknowledging that Jesus was the Son of God, that demon would have a place in heaven. And he doesn't. We know where the demon is today. Jesus cast them into a herd of swine and they ran down in the sea. So 
So thus far I told you all these things that doesn't that does not work. And it would be very unfair to come here and dump that on you and not tell you what does. So let's look at the interaction between Nicodemus and Jesus. In verse 21, it ends up very abruptly. We don't know anything other than they, they part ways. Nicodemus goes back home, probably tells his wife about what happened, goes back to work at the temple Monday morning, and we don't hear from him again for another four chapters. If you look over at verse, uh, in chapter 7, verses 45 through 52, we'll see Nicodemus come back on the scene. Um, I won't read it. I'm just going to, y'all can read it. Y'all can flip there, but I'll tell you what happened. The Pharisees are conspiring to put Jesus to death. They, they, they pull a council, they have a council of the Sanhedrin, which Nicodemus is part of. They send the guards to arrest him. The guards come back empty handed. And the, the, the Sanhedrin, the group of Pharisees, say, Where's he at? Why didn't you bring him back? And they were, the guards respond and says, No man has ever spoke to us like this. So they didn't bring him back. At that point in time, of course, they, they scold the guards. Nicodemus speaks up. And he, again, he knew the law, um, forwards and backwards. And he used that law to say, Our law prohibits us from condemning this man without giving the, him the opportunity to defend himself. And I'm paraphrasing. This is our first interaction with Nicodemus to see that something during that meeting with him and Jesus changed his life. Mm -hmm. He wasn't afraid of his friends or the group anymore. He still, has, he still wasn't there, but there was a change in him because he spoke up for what he knew to be true. Let's flip over to John chapter 19 and I'm going to read 38 through 42. Jesus has been crucified on the cross uh, and taken down. Uh, he was obviously crucified as a criminal. So there would have been a certain procedure for the body that, that, the, that we see Joseph of Arimathea didn't want to go through. So, um, after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for the fear of the Jews, asked Pilate he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. And they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb which no one had been laid. So there lay they Jesus, because the Jews' preparation day for the tomb. Because of the Jews' preparation day for the tomb was nearby. At surface level, we think, okay, and, uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus just went and did something nice for Jesus. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's gone. Keep in mind as I walk through this next piece that Sunday morning hadn't happened yet. This is late Friday afternoon. It's Passover. We see that Nicodemus brings the myrrh of the aloe and prepares Jesus' body for burial. But one thing that the scripture doesn't talk about, we just assume we're going to figure out. Remember how I told you that Nicodemus had set his whole life up based on following the law, doing what those 613 laws plus all the man made ones that were in place required of him, and it was his whole identity? I think it's a nice story, but. One of the most sacred laws that Nicodemus would have never been able to violate was he was never allowed to come in contact with a dead body. That law in, in Jewish Orthodox society still exists today. You or I, as just a common person, could come in contact with a dead body. There was a seven-day purification process, and then we could go back into society. Once Nicodemus violated this, this standard, he was never allowed to serve in the temple again. He gave up everything he held dear. He gave up his standing in the community, his job, his friendships, the possibility of his family. I'm sure he had a lot of explaining to do when he got home to his wife that night. If his parents were still living, they would have been devastated, furious, because they, they set him aside as, as before he was even born. For this life. 
that he completely turned his back on. He gave it all up to serve Jesus. A Jesus that he didn't even know was going to come back from the dead. So what's the takeaway? Do I have to do more than say a prayer? Yes. Do I have to do more than just confess Jesus was the Son of God one time in my life? Yes. Do I have to give up a job and everything I hold dear? Of course not. The call is just to put Jesus first. But Nicodemus demonstrates that. And so as I wrap up and to come in and, and, and preach a sermon about all the things that don't work, about a guy giving up everything he held dear and saying that's what Christianity looks like, it, it does. But I think there's more than that. And I think we have to explain one final step and then we're going to have a, a, an invitation. What's on offer today is what Nicodemus experienced. Because I believe it was an easy choice for him. I don't believe it was hard at all. I think Nicodemus looked around at everything in his life, his friends, his job, his standing in society, all those laws that he held dear, and he saw nothing but corruption. But what he experienced in that five minutes with Jesus was something beautiful. It was amazing. It was pure. It was unmatched. It was truthful. It was uncorrupted. And it was a love like he never experienced at any other time in his life. Jesus didn't gloss over with him. He gave him a hard truth, but he gave him a truth in a loving way because he wanted it. He wanted Nicodemus to change the direction of his life. I don't think it was a hard choice at all. Today's message isn't about judgment. It's not about what you did yesterday or last year or 30 years ago. It doesn't matter. And I can assure you, those of you that know me know that, that I have no way to stand in judgment of anybody. We all have a sin nature. We're all a corrupt version of what God intended us to be. But today is about pressing the restart button in your life and say, I want Jesus to be ahead of it all. Because what Jesus offers is better than all of that. Yep. And in all honesty, it's a sense of freedom. Mm -hmm. It's freedom from being held by those things that society and the world and everything else tells us is so important. And to come and experience genuine, true love so as I close up, and I'm asking Stan to come. Um, Miss Judy, you want to lead the singing? You want to close? Or want to Stan to close this song? 272. 272. I think we all probably find ourselves in three spots. What's God saying to you? I can tell you as I prepared this, and um, work on it. Small amount, several days, so it was a process for me. But I fall into one of the categories myself. Number one, if you've never made a decision for Jesus, let's settle it today. If sometime years ago you said a prayer or maybe got baptized and nothing changed in your life, if that's you, let's fix it today. I want to make Jesus Lord of my life. I want to be like the wind. I want Christ in me to affect everything I come in contact with. Or thirdly, and this is where I felt like I felt. I know I'm saved. There was a time in my life when I was on fire for God. Over the years, that fire dwindled. It's gotten hot and dwindled again, but I've gotten colder in the last couple months for sure. And I just felt the need that it was time for me to rededicate my life to Christ so I could be like that woman. It affects everything around it. You can't see it. You can't touch it. But when somebody walks in the room, they know it's there. That's what we're called to be. And so, I mean, I thought Kenneth would be here, but we're going to sing and then uh, stay and play. I'm just going to come sit down front. The invitation is this. If there's something that spoke to you, just come spend some time with God. I'm here if someone wants to talk to me. Um, I don't claim to have all the answers, but uh, we can find them. And so, thanks so much for the opportunity to come and speak. And I want to ask you to uh, lead us in singing in the song. Thank you. Anybody feel glad the altar is open? Um, I don't think God ever gets tired of us kneeling to Him and praying to Him. So you do what the Lord needs you to do. And if you
you want to pray with me or Jim or Pastor Kimmy next week, whatever, you know, just feel free to do it, you know. Don't, don't suppress the Holy Spirit. Page 272.